take this magic compound and you are going to become young again or you are going to live longer or you are become going to live thousands of years longer and there will be no diseases that is only a business way of selling things scientists don't say that so then comes what shall we do but until 20 years ago we could not explain why exercise was good because if you measure anything during exercise or even soon after exercise there were high levels of stress proteins there were heat shock proteins there were free radicals going crazy in the body there were acids in the body being accumulated oxygen is the biggest killer in the body but without oxygen we don't live low level these things induce stress and induce the defense mechanisms of the body and they do all the good things and that holistic method which in the last about 30 years which has become very well studied scientifically is the phenomenon of hormesis hi I am Mustafa Inamdar and this is Longevity India podcast where we explore the fascinating world of healthy aging and longevity. Our aim is simple to bring you insights from industry leaders ensuring that you remain informed about the cutting edge advancements in this field. You can tune into Longevity India podcast completely free of cost on various platforms including YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music and Google Podcast. It is our way of ensuring that this invaluable knowledge remains accessible to as many people as possible. Be sure to check out our sponsor Decode Age, India's pioneering longevity research company dedicated for enhancing your well-being via science-backed supplements and tests. Do check them out to support Longevity India podcast series. Now let's dive right into this exciting episode. I hope you find it insightful. So, hello Suresh ji, how are you? I'm very fine. Nice to see you again, Mustafa ji. It's a pleasure to have you back on Longevity India podcast. Well, I'm happy too. So, what do we want to talk today? So, yeah, I uh, I have been following some practices, you know, from past one year uh, mm-hmm. after starting Longevity India podcast and after listening to all the experts. Uh, I am going for a morning run daily, I go hiking twice or thrice a month and also quite frequently consume a rainbow salad. And uh, lots of people like me exist that are for example taking cold showers after listening or reading about heat shock proteins. And the reason I am really excited to talk with you today is that you literally did experiments in your lab on cells on petri dishes and studied the effect of heat shock on them and other countless number of experiments like this done by you and other scientists have now translated into all of these practices like cold shower or sauna bath that people are following all all around the world and getting health benefits. So thank you very much Suresh ji for taking your time out today for Longevity India podcast. Thank you and you are doing nice things. Why are you doing those things? be better health wise uh-huh. i mean i feel the difference okay okay and uh, like in which way you feel the difference so i am more energetic than daily and you know uh, productivity wise uh, in terms of work i have seen a lots of improvement for example in the morning i used to have that brain fog and everything but as i am doing intermittent fasting so i am very active in the morning till 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. and I can see that I'm doing completing my work really fast and and personally also I used to have inflammation on chest for example and Mm -hmm. after doing intermittent fasting and eating this rainbow salad and everything that has completely gone like without any external medication so for me it was nice So are you doing all this to have uh, uh, a better old age and live longer or what is the purpose? 
uh, health on daily basis. I should feel good right now. Exactly. Exactly. So that exactly. that's the exactly. motivation also that I am feeling good daily. So that's the reason why I'm continuing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that that's very important aspect because at the moment you are in your mid twenties. Uh, it's nothing to do with aging. Uh, mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with how long you can live. Uh, you are improving, maintaining health at the right time in the right manner. So we will definitely talk about these things. But because uh, I have spent my life studying issues in old age, why mm -hmm. do we become old? How long we can live? How long we want to live? And that was what we talked in the first podcast with yeah. you. So we will carry on in these intervention parts, which you are mentioning, uh, which mm. is the phenomenon of hormesis. Uh, mm. But I would uh, like to use a minute or two just to recapitulate what we talked in the previous one hour long podcast. Yeah, sure. So that in case uh, some of your audience have not heard that, uh, mm. that where I come from, uh, from why I say what I'm saying it. So the basic things from aging research or biogerontology, which we have learned, or at least which I have understood so far after 45 years in the field, uh, there are two, three major points to understand that we, if we live longer than our species essential lifespan, which for our species Homo sapiens is around 45 years, we enter into old age, and there is nothing much to look forward to old age in biological terms because aging is primarily a downhill process, losing functionality, becoming frail, having problems, physical, mental, having diseases and dying. So that's the first thing that aging when it starts after our essential lifespan of about 45, a lot of what we call bad things are going to happen. So mm -hmm. we need to do something about it. And why we need to do something about it is because evolution has made us to live for about 45 years. That's what nature needs us for. But after that, it's a great achievement of human beings by developing technology, by developing science, by developing culture. So many things that we can hope to live double or even triple than that. But the beauty is evolution has not made any genes or any enemies or any programs to kill me from inside or to make me old. So these are the basic three understandings we need to have. That aging, if we live longer than 45, so if any of your audiences are beyond the age of 45, 50, 60, 70, first of all, congratulations. You made it because nature didn't make us for that life. So that's your own achievement of the as a human being. So aging, living life is our great achievement. Evolution has not given us perfect uh, systems to live such long lives because it needs only for about 45, as I keep saying. Uh, uh, so that is why we have to take care of ourselves. But evolution has not made any genes or enemies which we can eliminate either by sending a pill or a missile or something and live happily. That is also not possible. So this is where we stand. And then we have been touching on the things that, yes, we can take single compounds, plant extracts, this pill, that pill. They all help. They all help for basic survival. If I have a shortage of vitamins somewhere, those vitamins can compensate for that so, uh, shortage if I take outside. But none of them work on aging as such, on the rate of aging. It can mm -hmm. maintain health. So individual targets are very limited value. They have a limited value. They have some value but they have a limited value. And if somebody tries to convey you, or even I try to tell you that take this magic compound and you are going to become young again, or you are going to live longer, or you are become, going to live thousands of years longer and there will be no diseases, that is only a business way of selling things. Scientists don't say that. So then comes 
what shall we do? Yeah. So the approaches can be either the common so-called anti-aging that you want to reverse aging, which is not possible scientifically at the moment, or slow down the rate of aging. That is possible, but we don't know how to measure the rate of aging. Yeah. Or or eliminate death completely. That's the idealistic uh, aim, uh, which uh, we can go into philosophically, but uh, not technically. So what is our main strategy or what should be our main strategy? And that is where this kind of total physiological approaches come. That instead of taking one target at a time, mm -hmm. which is the model for biomedicine, that if there is one virus, then you find something to kill that virus or one bacterium which is needed to be eliminated. But when the body is a complex, dynamic system all the time, there is no homeostasis in our body. That needs help during more and more health. So basically, what you are doing at this age of mid-20s, that is very good to develop your own strong survival abilities your life now, but you are still in the pathway of growth, development, reproduction, maturity. This may or may not affect your old age. There are hundreds of other factors which will affect aging and which will affect the lifespan. So what we need to do, especially from around the age of 40 onwards, because until 45, evolution has taken care of our species very well. Mm -hmm. Then we need to start taking care of it just around that time, ideally say around 40, but otherwise even whenever you realize that you need to take care of your body if at 50, 60, 70, because at every level you will gain certain advantages. And that holistic method, which in the last about 30 years, which has become very well studied scientifically, is the phenomenon of hormesis. Now, that word, that's actually uh, one of my books a few years ago, Hormesis in Health and Longevity. Hormesis is basically what it means there, that if you challenge your body with some stress of choice, which actually causes disturbance in the body's survival mechanisms by creating even a little bit of damage, it's potentially possible to get lots of benefits out of it. It sounds paradoxical that stress being good, but this is what we all do all the time. You just mentioned even the cold bath or physical exercise. What is good about physical exercise when you run around marathons or fast racing or speed walking or in the gym? Biochemically, when I'm doing the exercise and you take any blood or any measurement, everything is terrible. Exercise is one of the worst things we can do to our body at a biochemical level. But everybody knows there is not even a single person who doubts now, both in scientific areas and general public consciousness, that exercise has benefits not only on the muscles which we exercise, but everything else beyond it. When I have a fast walking for an hour, it's not only that my leg muscles which are getting benefits, it's also my mood, it's also my immune system, it's also my cognition, it's also my memory, it's also my uh, whatever other property uh, you want to associate. So how do we start from a damage-inducing system to gaining overall benefits? And that is known to everybody. But until 20 years ago, we could not explain why exercise was good. Because if you measure anything during exercise or even soon after exercise, there were high levels of stress proteins. There were heat shock proteins. There were free radicals going crazy in the body. There were acids in the body being accumulated. But then the benefits, then the theory of hormesis, although the word was coined in 1930s, uh, but most of the work on the physiological hormesis for health started happening from mid-90s. And now, as you have already mentioned, there are hundreds and hundreds of scientific papers and research areas where hormesis is shown to work at whole body level, even mental level, even mood level. But hormesis, the paradigm 
the basic paradigm for hormesis is physical exercise. Mm -hmm. And nobody doubts that physical exercise has multiple pluripotent long-term effects. At each round of exercise, there is a small effect. But if you repeat it after giving some recovery time, it's cumulative. Yeah. And that's how exercise, I, I cannot expect to go to one exercise route and uh, then become young or healthy or live forever after one thing. It has to be done again and again. So the basic idea of hormesis is stress of choice, mild stress, and repeated exposure after certain periods of recovery. And we can talk about how do we choose it. So this is the phenomenon of hormesis. And then there are further words about that if it's working through mitochondria, some people call it mitohormesis. Yeah? Uh, but generally the word hormesis is, or physiological hormesis is used. And then I think about 20 years ago uh, or less, uh, we also coined a new term that anything which causes hormesis, which has good effects, we can call it hormetin. Yeah. It is just a, it's a, just a uh, term. I like to create new terms because it keeps my focus for discussion. Like exercise is a physical hormetin. Yeah? You already use the example of uh, cold water bath. Mm -hmm. Although there are very few peop uh, uh, papers published on cold water uh, therapy or cold water hormesis, uh, but that's also kind of hormetin. Most of the work published in experimental systems, it started from my lab and also hundreds of other labs now, is on heat shock. That if you give a little fever-like temperature, 40 degrees for one hour, two times a week to cells in the laboratory, they age very slowly and they live a little bit longer. So the parallel for human beings will be like going into sauna, yeah, that where uh, the temperature is around 41, 42, and having 15 to 20 minutes of uh, hot water bath, it will induce lots of heat shock proteins. So sauna, and this is a common story in many cultures. Many countries have various spa areas, hot water baths. And after all, for thousands of years, people claim that they have been getting benefits. But now we understand the scientific mechanism behind it, that this is hormesis, that when you give a little bit of stress like that, body responds by stress responses. There are seven stress responses, like in heat shock, it will be a heat shock response. And then hundreds of things happen in the body, which can give you benefits, and there are ways to find it. Uh, okay, that was a long monologue. But uh, uh, so the things which cause hormesis, they are called hormetins. Mm -hmm. And there are basically three or at the most four categories of hormetins, physical hormetins, exercise, mm -hmm. sauna, cold temperature, even radiation. People are afraid of radiation, but radiation, when it works in the biphasic dose response, biphasic means that everything can be toxic at certain level, but whereas at a certain lower level, it can have beneficial effects. This is biphasic. Yeah. yeah. Oxygen is the best example. Oxygen is the biggest killer in the body, but without oxygen, we don't live. So, but that has been certain dose response. Same thing about, uh, I, I already told you the exercise again. Exercise is good if it is moderate and with the repetition and recovery. Otherwise you can even kill yourself with exercise. Yeah. Mm. So it's a, that is the hormetic curve, which goes in biphasic dose response. At low level, these things induce stress and induce the defense mechanisms of the body. And they do all the good things. Some people uh, confuse it with homeopathy, that homeopathy claims the same thing. No, it's not true. Homeopathy claims to work at a level which is 10 orders of magnitude lower than the Avogadro number where molecules don't even exist. Yeah, so we have no idea. It's not a homeopathy. Hormesis is very different where you can show the dose response. So hormetins. Hormetins are the conditions which do that. Physical hormetins, I gave you some examples. <clears throat> then come, uh, say, nutritional hormetins. Mm -hmm. A lot of things which we eat in the food, they are actually poisons. They are very, very dangerous. They have no nutritional value. 
what is the nutritional value of uh, um, haldi turmeric <coughs> or ginger or garlic yeah these are nutritional in the sense protein carbohydrate and fats they have no such value in a significant amount but they all have beneficial effects as claimed in different cultures and now science also gives data because they are hormetins when i eat food with haldi, with the turmeric, what does turmeric do to my cells? We have done a lot of research ourselves and hundreds of papers are available from the world that actually <coughs> turmeric or the uh, curcumin in the turmeric causes a little bit of damage in the cell, in the proteins. Mm -hmm. huh? And that starts the, pro the cell says, oh dear, I am under damage. And it then activates hundreds of genes to counteract that damage, various kinds of protein damages. And as a result, you can sometimes see antioxidative effect that all those things which were damaged due to oxidation, they are now being either eliminated or repaired. And people start calling uh, haldi or turmeric as an antioxidant. No, 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 it is not antioxidant. It's a pro-oxidant. It actually causes the damage. Same thing is happening with black pepper. Same thing is happening with every spice. There are seven different pathways. There are some spices which create the signal like sirtuin pathway because the cell thinks I don't have the uh, energy enough and it activates sirtuin. That compound has just caused the stress. Similarly, like the sunlight or, or things which damage DNA. No, mm -hmm. when DNA is damaged at a low level, either by sunlight, or by certain food components, hundreds of repair enzymes get activated. They are the ones doing the job, not the damaging agent. So damaging agent is a hormetin. Yeah, unlike vitamins or other uh, kind of uh, compounds which work directly, hormetins work indirectly. They actually create the damage. Just again, coming back to physical exercise, if physical exercise does not produce extra free radicals, it has no benefit. There are beautiful experiments done with animals and even with some human beings, giving them strong antioxidants before exercise. And then you lose the benefit of exercise. Exercise is only good if it causes damage. Same thing is about nutritional thing. And hundreds of compounds are being tested now by scientists. Most famous ones were, for example, the resveratrol. There was a lot of work, again, originally promoted by David Sinclair. The resveratrol induces certain stress response through sirtuin pathways. And that is where its job finishes. Then the body takes over. So hormetins, this is a, a different now area which is becoming very hot. And just a few months ago, I have also created a new, uh, what, what we call the nomenclature for hormetins based on which pathway it induces. Like hormetin A are all those compounds which induce autophagy. Autophagy is the pathway where the cell thinks or feels uh, that there is not enough material or food, so it starts eating itself. Yeah? All the bad molecules, it will return over. So hormetin A will be all those things which induce autophagy. Similarly, hormetin uh, H will be all those uh, hormetins which induce heat shock protein because that's a different pathway. Then hormetin, hormetin um, uh, N will be those who which induce inflammation pathway. Now I have those five categories. It's just like 100 years ago, they made vitamin categories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, so now we have hormetin categories of various combinations, which will be the future of some of the interventions. Uh, the important thing, about hormetins to remember is that these are not just re-establishing what is deficient in the body. It's not like vitamins, that if I take vitamin D from outside, it's because my own levels of vitamin D are reduced and I need to take supplement. They don't do anything extra. Same thing about some of the minerals. But hormetins, which are like spices and hundreds of other polyphenols uh, and flavonoids, uh, and they are every day new and new examples are coming. They actually 
do a kind of what you say the intracellular exercise if you can use that word that mm -hmm. within the cell it creates the tension stress and the cell which has the mechanisms tries to meet that challenge yeah so they are not adding to some loss part but they are activating your own living mechanisms to live better and that is why I think this field of hormesis and hormetin is very, very uh, important and a great breakthrough in aging research. And lots of papers are now interpreted from hormetic point of view and hormetic way of life. We can talk a little bit long. Sorry, I took a bit longer to explain this uh, area, but I think that was important to do that. Okay. So, uh, Suresh, I was interested to know that how did you start with hormesis research? Like what your first hypothesis or first experiment was like? Ah, well, okay. Those are not very interesting areas. Again, that's just history. I know you like to know history, but that's important to know. Uh, but we will come back to the use of hormesis again. In 1992 or three, something, yeah, just around that time, Hormesis was already known in the literature from 1935. Yeah? And there have been a lot of papers published already in 1960s and 70s about good effects of radiation. And but people didn't want to touch those papers because radiation was the evil part, especially after uh, the use of atomic bomb. Yeah, radiation became a no-go area. That how can radiation be good? But actually, it was found in animal studies with rats and mice that low level of repeated different types of radiations did a lot of good things to their health and even increased the lifespan of animals. Then the data even from human beings started coming that people living in those areas with high radiation background of radon, like in America, and there are some areas in uh, India also. In my book, Age, I list all those things. Those people have better health quality. They have low cancers. So radiation as an anti-cancer mechanism and health promoter was already well known, but it was not being uh, talked openly because that has political uh, implications. But then in 1990s, one guy in uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, America, uh, Professor Edward Calabres, he started reviewing papers, published papers on radiation biology, toxicology, pharmacology, many, many areas. And he could see that there was no such thing as a linear dose response, that there is something which is toxic, then more you give it, it becomes more toxic and more toxic and more. No, actually all curves, and there is no exception, are biphasic. So so-called toxic thing, before it kills the system, it actually promotes the growth of the systems. Yeah, There is no exception to that. And that is called the hormetic curve. That And that has very serious implications in many therapies. Even antibiotics can do that. That if you don't take the proper dose of antibiotics for the given time, and if you reduce it too low, at that low might become actually beneficial for the bacteria. Mm -hmm. yeah, bacteria like to grow in that. Cancer cells do the same thing. Same things which kill cancer cells at higher dose, at low level, it promotes the cancer cell. So there was a lot of information which uh, Ed Calabres, whom we call the modern, uh, so-called father of modern hormesis. So at that time, then I was working on the heat shock research in some other context in cellular aging. Then we thought, okay, can I do something with the heat? If I give heat to human cells, which we normally grow at 37 degrees in the laboratory, the skin fibroblasts, if I give them some kind of fever, different high temperature, what will happen? There was a lot of research available on heat shock response. People used to give 42.5 degrees or 43 degrees and to study how important these heat shock proteins are. But you cannot repeat the same heat shock at 43 degrees with the same cells again and again. They die. So I thought, can I find a temperature where I can do it again and again, like exercise once or twice a week? So we tried many temperatures from 43 downward or 45 downward all the way to 37. And we settled on 41 degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Now, why we settled on 41 degrees, that's a, a little bit of politics, little bit of facilities. I didn't have too much uh, staff, how many more things I can try. So we settled on 41 degrees because that is where it was one third of the maximum response. If I give 43 degrees to cell, they made certain heat shock proteins, which were very important for their survival. If they didn't make, they die. Yeah, but I cannot repeat it next day, the 43 again. So mm -hmm. we chose that when there is one third of the response, there is no logic why one third. We were trying many things. We just settled on one third due to uh, technical reasons that how many combinations we can. And that started showing amazing effects in human cells. They were getting two times a week, one hour of 41 degree, and then recovery for two days and then another round. And they carried on taking it without looking old, the way I was used to seeing them becoming old. They didn't become old. They lived a little bit longer, but they maintained their health. So after that original study, which I did in 90, uh, 92, 3, 4, I think those three years, and I published the first paper, I think, in 1995, then many PhDs and master's theses were done in my laboratory, working out everything what happens to cell when you give this kind of heat shock? Yeah. And that has been continuing from 95 until I stopped doing the laboratory work in 2020 or 2021. So hundreds of papers were published by other people, by my labs, my students. And that area became established that at least heat shock in the culture was doing. And we gave proof that hormesis works. So that's the story of uh, hormesis research in my labs. So how do you feel now that people are taking cold plunges all over the world for better health? Yeah, very good, very good. But if somebody tells them that you're going to become young again and live forever, that is rubbish. Yeah, mm -hmm. that I have already talked in the first part. Don't worry about the length of life yeah, or really old age. What you worry is to recover health, to improve health, to enhance health for your daily needs. What is health to you? What do you want to do? And young age, you are doing these things for something else, for either improving health, either for competition, all these, uh, there's world athletics going on. Uh, just look at the hard work these guys do, but they are not doing it for health purposes. That is for the rewards and awards and the medals, which can be sometimes even dangerous. Sometimes the young generation of your age group, they have been just, have been becoming too much obsessed about doing too much exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they are, the reasons are not health. The reasons are, whether I have six packs, whether I look nice, whether I do that thing. Those are a lot of social reasons, which are important reasons, but you can overdo it. Mm -hmm. Overdoing too much exercise in young age is can be actually biologically uh, very costly in terms of uh, uh, disturbed reproductive rhythms. Yeah. So generally it's a scene that too much self-obsession on health in young age results in reduced reproductive ability. Yeah. So there are data from animals and human beings also. Here in the field of aging, because that's again, we are talking in this podcast, that where we are actually beyond the reproductive age, as we discussed that, 50, 60, 70, you will get benefits towards gaining health if you expose yourself to stress of choice. And this is a very important word stress of choice at least in the case of human beings because otherwise we have so much stress in our work in our daily lives in our relationships and if some bosses try to use the excuse of hormesis that ah Suresh she tells hormesis uh, stress is good for you so why you, you complain that I am pushing you no 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 that's a different that's a stress which you haven't chosen but even after stressful work in the office you will go in the evening and choose more stress, running or water or exercise. That's the stress of choice. Stress of choice is very important because, first of all, you have to regulate it. It has to be mild stress. Yeah, Mild also is a difficult uh, uh, term to explain. Mild for what, for whom? under which condition, there are lots of questions which we can discuss scientifically. So all those things which you guys are doing at young age, 
are very good to improve your own homeodynamics, which may give you certain benefits later in life. But those who have not done those things, because my first 50 years of life, those are happened. But now I am facing the challenges in mobility and other things. Now I can also use hormesis for improving health. And the central part here is don't make stress as your enemy. Stress is actually the principle of life. Every time I breathe, I create oxidative disturbance in the body. And that is what keeps my biochemistry going. Every time I eat food, the food is the most damage-causing thing in the body. Glucose. It just destroys everything. But without that, you could not produce energy. Basic metabolism makes so many errors, so many stressful events. So basically, the thing is understanding. Again, last time also we talked about the knowledge from aging research mm -hmm. has to be assimilated and practiced instead of having uh, the quick formula. But that's how we are so in society. We expect quick formula. Somebody else has either done the research but make a pill. No, no, pills are there. But use them with this knowledge that none of them is magic. It's not going to make you young. It's not going to make you live longer. And most of those pills which are targeted on single things, they don't do anything more than what vitamins can do at some stage. We never claim that vitamins are going to make you live longer. Yeah? But whereas hormatins can have, because hormatins are improving your whole body itself. It's living mechanisms, it's survival ability. So that is the hormetic way of life. So physical hormetins, I have given you examples. Nutritional hormetins in the food, which can be part of the food or taken as supplements. We have no idea whether supplements will work or not, but that's where researches are happening. Uh, uh, and then the third is the mental hormetins. That's the brain exercise. How do you keep your brain and mind healthy and happy by hormesis? Not only simple uh, brain exercises of doing jigsaw puzzles or uh, uh, sudoku or playing chess, but social engagement, your social behavior, your social relationships, they are hormetic. They are a kind of a challenge. Relationships are not easygoing stuff. Relationships always keep you on your toes. If you really want to have good relationships, if you want to have good social engagement, so these are very, very important hormetins and people are developing even some kind of uh, new brain exercises to keep the brain and mind uh, healthy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Like uh, reading uh, uh, a, a page of a book in the, in the mirror, yeah? mirror image reading or counting from 100 to zero, jumping three, yeah? 197, 94, 91, that way it will... Because these things induce certain kind of a stress responses. Even meditation, that's again sounds paradoxical, but there are some studies also from India by some of my friends in uh, uh, Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar and other places, that people, if they are asked to be in focused attention, so in science we don't use the word meditation, we sometimes use it, focused attention, within 10 or 15 minutes of focused attention, which can be in mindful exercise or some of the other, you take their saliva, same heat shock proteins or stress proteins appear. What's that happening? You think you are relaxing, but no, body is taking it as a mild challenge, stress. And once those proteins are made, they are going to do hundreds of good things. Yeah. Experienced meditation people, these are Buddhist monks or some people who have been very hard uh, meditation practice practitioners, their basal levels of stress proteins are higher than so-called normal non-meditating people. But those stress proteins, basal level is not causing problem for them. They are actually keeping their whole survival machinery or homeodynamic space which we didn't get a chance to talk last time. That's our survival ability, homeodynamic space, in a good form. 
So mental exercises, which include social engagement, going into company, having good relationships, having uh, doing certain social charity work, even uh, there's a donation kind of stuff. They, all they make you feel good. And if you feel good by doing this little extra effort, then that is hormesis. So mental hormetins are equally important for brain health and mental health. So these are the hormetins is a very, very promising area. Although in the literature and in public's general knowledge, the word antioxidant has become so, so ingrained that we call any good effects as antioxidative. And no, no, no. Actually, these can be pro-oxidative. Like, uh, so they, uh, I can give you a perfect antioxidant. You know, people are so obsessed about antioxidants, which can take away free radicals. I can give you a perfect antioxidant, which will take away all the free radicals. What do you think will happen? Will you become young? No, I don't think so. What will happen? Uh, so antioxidants, free radicals will not be there. And if free radicals are not there, so whatever good things that those free radicals were supposed to do will not happen. And that the consequence will be? Uh, you will die. Yeah. If I give you a perfect antioxidant, which takes away all your free radicals simultaneously, you will die in the millisecond. Because antiox or free radicals and oxidants are part and parcel of our biochemistry. Mm -hmm. Without free radical and oxidation phosphorylation reactions, you don't produce ATP. You don't, immune system depends upon free radicals to kill bacteria, hmm? viruses. Immune system will be the biggest one to suffer. Actually, some people, even people like James Watson, the Nobel Prize winner in DNA structure, he wrote a paper about five years ago, a bit longer. Antioxidants cause cancer. Hmm? Because cancer cells get killed by the production of our antioxidants. So if you take away free radicals, you actually give chance for the cancer cell to survive better because the killer is gone. Yeah. So these things need to be understood because there we made it a, a easy solution that there is free radical. So that is the enemy. So if you kill the enemy, you live happily thereafter. This is one way of doing a reductionistic science. You choose, you find the enemy. Socially, politically, <laughs> biologically, and then you send a missile to kill the enemy. And problem is solved. No, 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 it doesn't happen. Because without that free radicals, we cannot live. So this kind of approach has to be changed. That there is no enemy. We don't need to kill anybody. All this war rhetoric, even for the anti-aging, war against aging. I hate those terminology. What is it mean, war against aging? It's the, it's the effort towards life. If we want to live longer and better, about longer, we cannot do too much now. Because by removing, uh, as we talked last time, by removing infectious diseases, by improving hygiene, by having uh, better food availability, by having all, we have already taken care of so many things that we have doubled the lifespan. Now, even if you treat all the seven major diseases of old age, like cancers, Alzheimer, uh, um, osteoporosis, diabetes, the calculations by demographers show that if you remove all the major diseases of old age, at a population level, you won't add more than five or six years of life. Hmm. Of course, at an individual level, it can make the difference that if I have a serious disease like cancer, that can, if it's not treated, I might die in a year or two years. And if I am being treated with present situation, I might live another five or six or seven or 10 years, or there might be even better things that it will make me live another, say, 10 or 15. But at a population level, if you remove all cancers from the world today, do you know what will it add to the average lifespan of the populations? Around, exactly. three, year, uh, around three years. So, so basically, making life longer requires a second revolution, either some very, very powerful technologies which can redesign the body, recreate the body. Otherwise, we can live better 
without falling into the trap of certain serious diseases. And hormesis promises that, that you can do your best to improve and maintain health, which you will get benefits in terms of better health at any age you want and whatever health means to you. Like if you want, even in young age, if your health today means to you that you should be able to run those 10 kilometers. And if you feel a little weak about that, yeah, take something. Mm -hmm. But in old days, as I already gave the examples, health will mean many things depending upon my day-to-day -day life, my situation, my other health conditions. Yeah? And those are important aspects of understanding aging and practicing healthy old age. This part needs to be talked in public more and more widely. Scientists keep talking about, oh, we will have 10 years in the next 15 years and 30 years in that and escape velocity. I was listening to that interview, very interesting interview with my friend Aubrey de Grey. But again, what? How? What are you actually limiting? But those things attract the audience. So if I tell you that I can make you live 200 years, you will give that as your title of this podcast and people will like to watch it. Rubbish. I made some uh, uh, video serials about 10 years ago giving the title Stopping Aging in Two Minutes. Oh, a lot of people wanted to watch it, but I was cheating them because those lectures were only two minutes long. So <laughs> stopping aging in two minutes because I was speaking only two minutes at a time. <laughs> So, so people didn't get, uh, it, it's the same thing because people want anti-obesity pill, which has just come out from Novo Nordisk, our Danish company, and is mm -hmm. selling in huge quantities because people think it can make you become thin or weight, lose weight. Instead of doing active interventions, if you can eat your hamburger or a five protas and eat a pill, well, of course, that's very easy. It's just like in social life. I can do all the bad things in daily life, but if I go to a place where I will be forgiven after a prayer or after giving some puja, that is the easiest part. Then I keep on sucking the blood of my uh, other human beings and get the clearance certificate in the evening or in the morning. In the morning, you get for the rest of the day. <laughs> in the evening, you get it. It doesn't work. We cannot use those approaches in science also, in biology also. These magic pills or formulas or pardons or prayers or this kind of things. Sorry, I get excited on those things because these have very important social implications. So, Suriji, I was also thinking days back that, you know, uh, humans are becoming just target audience now, right? Mm. For fast food chains, burger, you are a target audience. Then after that, yes. you become sedentary. For Netflix, mm. you are a target audience to make you yes. sedentary. And after yes. all that, when you become obese, then this mm. company is selling drugs to make you thin. Mm. Again, for yeah. them, you are a target audience uh, with the yes. help of which they can earn profit. So that is mm. happening everywhere. And mm -hmm. I don't know, conversation like this. Uh, no, the thing is that we cannot just tell people are becoming, we are all becoming like that. Yeah. It's not that I am not becoming and you are becoming it. But why are we becoming it? What has changed our value system? Because somehow, especially after the Second World War in Europe and the world, uh, there was so much destruction, so much poverty, etc. Uh, that we, then somehow the power went into the gods of money. Mm -hmm. everything has to be produced wealth has to be increased so when you go into the wealth worship Lakshmi Puja became so important that Saraswati Puja or any other kind of Puja which was giving us the life values became shadowed if everything is decided based on the profit margin so the companies make products to make profit there are no companies who, even the pharmaceutical companies, don't make drugs for your health. First and foremost is to make money. And then, yes, health is also benefited. If a pharmaceutical company does not make a profit, it's not going to keep on making those things. So when profit is everywhere, and why we have given so much power to the profit makers and the money makers, that's what we need to think. If we have started worshipping so much money power 
all decisions are made on money, then those are the consequences. Then we cannot speak against why people. And then those people who are making us addicted to uh, social media or fast food, yeah, are they doing it for the sake of harming us? They think they are helping us to enjoy life, but their main incentive is how to make money. Yeah. And, and if everybody is making, that's why for the young people, you asked me last time, what is the uh, suggestion? So ideal way of finding what you like to do or what you would like to do is, will you do something where you don't even make money? Yeah, That will be the real test. Although we need money for survival, of course, there is. That is where actually the principles of hormesis again come. Let's wind up on that because I think we have used yeah. almost one hour. Principles of hormesis. What is the hormetic way of life? How to live hormetically? How to choose your stress? There are three principles. I will briefly discuss them. First of all, Whatever you do in life, whether you eat food or you are doing physical exercise or you are doing social engagement or whatever, it must give you pleasure. If you do not feel happy in what you are doing or what you are eating or what you are, what kind of people you are with, that is not going to be health beneficial. Now, this is a very serious issue because pleasure we also get from eating McDonald's or other rubbish kind of stuff. But there the pleasure can be very easily identified. When I eat a Big Mac, after 20 minutes, I start beating myself. Oh, why did you eat it? Why did you eat it? You know, you feel guilty. So, so pleasure is, which stays with you in terms of food, for example, for at least three days. So eat the food which gives you pleasure and pleasure stays with you. You don't feel guilty. Yes, some. if I'm totally weirdo, that I'm so abnormal that even having all these horrible things give me pleasure continuously, okay, that's a special problem. But normal healthy brain knows when we do right things. Or pleasure is a very, very important part of our life at all levels. Food, physical activity, social relationship. We can talk separately longer on that. Second part of hormetic way of life is moderation. Yeah, that goes into the common sense also. Not doing anything too much. Having moderation in the in eating, yeah, in living, which basically means not rushing. But moderation is again a very difficult story because we have to learn that's a psychological one. Even money is needed in moderation. Food is needed in moderation. Yeah? Now, moderation is again a big concept. In aging research, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, etc., come to that level. Like intermittent fasting you mentioned, that's a, actually a hormetin because it creates the stress and you get out of AG and NRF2 and so many things. Pleasure, moderation, and final thing is variety. Even in exercise, you don't do the exercise of the same muscle two, three days in a row. Because a lot of good things happen in hormesis when you are not doing it. When I do exercise, actually, I'm creating bad things. But after exercise, during recovery time, all the good things happen. And that's where you have to combine them. So that's a variety. And variety is also part, again, in all aspects of life. You cannot have a pleasure in something and keep overdoing it and keep doing it again and again and again without change in there. So... Hormetic way of life, which I hope soon I will be able to write a popular book for general public, how to live hormetically. Hormetically mm -hmm. is how to choose your challenges of life and use them with pleasure, moderation, and variety, and it will keep you happy and healthy. Don't worry about how long you are going to die, live or die, because that's where the chance factor will come in, which we have already mentioned a little bit. So I think that's my final message on the hormetic way of life. You can even use this as a title for your podcast. What is hormetic way of life? Sure, I will do that. Hormetic yeah. way of life, a good title for this podcast. Yeah. Yes. So, oh, so yeah. one thing... Anything is, final? Anything you want to ask or say? This one particular question I had, you know, one of the reasons why I really like the... Cons I, and I'm sorry for that, but... Uh, the concept of hormesis is that it gives you a little window to drink alcohol 
and that's a huge deal for people like me who enjoys alcohol but i know that it's also restrict you to have only half a glass more than mm-hmm. that it will be harmful but still when i'm drinking i'm giving myself this explanation that it's all right it will do hormesis yeah, yeah. if, if you are so clear that it is in the hormetic dose yeah there are lots of papers showing that uh, a, a small drinking wine drinking alcohol drinking population has better survival and better cardiovascular health than totally non drinkers or heavy drinkers the problem with these kinds of addictive things are what we call small may not be biologically hormetic this is what the uh, uh, smoking industry wanted to use uh, smoking as a hormet hormetin which is rubbish yeah because uh, but we don't say you so you should smoke 20 cigarettes a day even one might be good no it's not good because smoke is not we don't know the hormetic curves there so yes there are certain hormetic benefits of alcohol just like any other flavonoids and uh, all the polyphenols so but the principles will have to be pleasure moderation the hormetic dose of moderation which is difficult to measure and stay with that and variety enjoy your alcohol feel happy but don't yeah, find other excuses of overdoing yeah half a glass will do i don't know for what is your oh. we have the methods to measure it that okay how much will be good for you you need to go through a lot of uh, little clinical testing there is no general formula just like exercise there is no general formula uh, half an hour five days a week is good for everybody no 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 yeah so but individual answers can be given you have to call me to your clinic and i can help you find your uh, hormetic doses every individual might need to go through certain clinical tests and observations and we can definitely make a hormetic protocol for physical exercise for food yeah these two things and or the supplements there is a lot of research work going on basically from hormesis point of view that how to make it what is good for me under all the and it's not easy thing that's that's called the personalized medicine even mm-hmm. in the serious diseases they want to do personalized medicine but at the moment we don't know how to do it so th- that these things which is not dealing with a problem is dealing with life these are even more challenging but that is the knowledge my role of talking these two podcasts with you was trying to synthesize the lot of information available in the world into certain knowledge all those principles and then knowledge when applied for the good of everybody is wisdom huh? information to knowledge to wisdom and that's what i have tried to do that how you can create your own wisdom huh? by having correct knowledge and then use is there is no single formula there is no magic pill there is no mantra there is no puri there is nothing to keep you alive if you want to stay alive live hormetically so uh, okay. one one last thing that i wanted to ask you is that you <laughs> another know another last okay yes, i'm sorry that how do you perceive the common response to scientific studies for example on fasting where mm. people claim that this was already part of our tradition and now science yes. is just proving it especially when mm. presented dismissively as if to suggest mm. that we don't need scientific validation no no but the thing is a uh, lot of things in history or folk knowledge or uh, common sense they are correct but when they get the scientific mechanistic explanation that why they are good then it becomes scientific knowledge ultimate aim of science is to become common knowledge common sense that's the ultimate aim but the common sense may not be scientific there is a lot of crap filled up in common sense also so those observations cultural observations like even this hormesis it was even in greek mythology or greek uh, time 300 uh, bc they were talk what does not kill you makes you stronger you yeah? know yeah. those kind of thing but why why it's making you stronger they didn't know the mechanisms it's the same thing when your dadi par dadi tells eat healthy food or this or that or don't overdo these are fine these are correct common senses but why science help you to make it into real knowledge all common sense is not rubbish but all common sense is not correct also yeah 
ultimate aim of science is to become common sense. I repeat it again and again. That's the final aim where the scientific fact becomes your daily life. And just like exercise has become. So, so this is my response to science. So I would like to be a person with a lot of common sense if I can. But that for that, I had to work for a long time to study science. That, that's all questions I had, Suresh. Okay, Mustafa. It has been great talking to you, son, and I hope uh, uh, your audience will enjoy it and just keep me informed. Any questions, you can always write to me or raise in the, ask your audience to raise in the comments on wherever they watch it, and I can try to answer even there. Otherwise, call me to India, and I will give you a series of lectures all around the country. Please do let me know when you are coming. No, not that you have to call me. I don't come on. You have to call okay. me. To arrange, the, arrange the program. I should know where to give the lecture. I can't just uh, <laughs> start talking anywhere. Yeah, well, well, that's on the side. You can use these things or cut it off as you like it. But I think these two hours of uh, two hourly sessions, they have been very good for me also to clarify some of my own points. And I hope uh, you're... It was wonderful to, to talk to you. Yes. Thank okay, you. great. So nice talking. Aaj ki mulaqat bas itni. Thank you. Thank you for your time.